Dr. Carrie Magro is an award-winning public speaker, best-selling author, autism entertainment consultant, nonprofit founder, anti-bullying activist, and autistic self-advocate. He was diagnosed with autism at the age of four. For his efforts, Carrie has been featured in major media and worked with amazing brands, including NBC's Today Show, CBS News, Inside Edition, Upworthy, and HuffPost, among others. In short, Carrie has a long history of breaking down barriers for himself and the ASD community, and we're excited to have him with us today. Carrie, so first, your work is quite impressive. Um, and we are honored to have you join us on the Brain Possible podcast. To start, can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to the world of public speaking? Sure. So uh, when I was in college, I came out for the first time about having autism. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with autism when I was four. And I realized that there was not a lot being done in terms of disability advocacy mm. uh, in my home state of New Jersey. So I really wanted to, I actually trained, changed career paths. I went for my undergraduate degree at St. Hall University in sport management. I was like laser focused on having a career in the sports realm. But knowing that there were so many individuals who were struggling with disabilities made me decide to change career paths. Went for my master's in strategic communications uh, with a scholarship from the National Speakers Association who really told me there was a niche in this area that re really was untapped. Mm -hmm. And it, it made me want to change career paths. So I've been uh, public speaking now for uh, the past decade, and it's just been amazing to get the opportunity to travel the globe as an avid traveler myself, but also to, to get to connect with so many families who have been impacted by uh, disabilities as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's gratifying work. Um, how often do you travel and how is your speaking career kind of changed over the last uh, year and a half? Oh, well, the, the how it's changed is I have to remember not to be on mute. I feel like with yeah. st still people today, even like a year into having Zoom be like the new focus, I, I always have to remember to take myself on mute. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of virtual presentations, but uh, I, I, I honestly, before COVID, it was, I would be out of state three or four times a month. Uh, and it, it was it was a lot of fun. It was just super engaging, just being able to travel. And uh, one of the fun things we get to do, in, in in addition to public speaking, is every single place I go to speak, I bring a tripod and a camera, and I sit down with local self advocates who are disabled to give them a platform to share their stories. We mm. have about. 213,000 Facebook followers now. So not only do we give a platform for these kids to, and these adults to uh, nurture their own self-advocacy, but we also hope, hopefully give them an opportunity to get the word out about all the great stuff that they're doing too. That's awesome. Um, do you primarily, um, is your audience primarily younger, like adolescents? What would you say? Uh, so most of my public speaking is typically for parents, educators, and businesses. Mm -hmm. Those are usually, most, most of the time when we go to businesses, we talk about the ROI benefits of hiring people with disabilities in the workplace because the unemployment rate is so high. And then uh, the rest of my work is really K through 12 faculty and uh, student assemblies on being kind, bullying prevention, and then also teachers teaching the way that our students learn, uh, especially in special education, yeah. and then uh, parent support groups, because I, I mean, there, there's still so many parents who uh, are really unsure about the, the journey for their disabled child and being able to be a liaison and to be a soundboard of uh, information in my talks, but then also afterwards uh, being able to meet them on their level and mm -hmm. talk to them about the topics that they're facing from everything from that initial diagnosis all the way to later on in guardianship and financial planning for when their kid is an adult. Yeah, that is awesome. I really like the idea of um, you speaking to educators. Is that one of your big places you go to speak? Do you get to the opportunity to speak to a lot of schools or educators? I often get to speak more as part of student assemblies to students versus okay. 
years. And, That's great, uh, though. Yeah, no, it's it, it, it's definitely a pleasure. But the, the one big thing that I really hope to advocate for is the fact that uh, there have been statistics that have indicated that one in three teachers in the United States today uh, don't receive any form of uh, training when it comes to special education in terms of professional development training. And I feel like that's so unfortunate with the rising number of students who have disabilities in the United mm -hmm. States. Some statistics indicate that at least one in six children have some form of developmental disability. Yeah. We need to do a lot more justice by giving professional development opportunities for educators to understand this community. I agree completely. Yeah, I think um, teachers seem to be taught to teach to like the average, like that top of the bell curve. Um, and what about the rest of the people? And they don't know, um, maybe they're not equipped uh, to to handle children in their classroom who have varying degrees of um, neurological conditions or diagnosis. And also I find it's like kind of upsetting too. I think they should talk to the other kids and educate them about disabilities too, you know, that everyone is unique and different and kind of emotional intelligence. They should care and kind. I think that should be part of um, no, all education. I no, I absolutely agree because, I, I mean, we talk about, to parents so much about how early intervention is the key, but if you give a kid an education about diversity and help them understand not only disability, but race, sexual orientation, it really helps open their eyes to the world that, I mean, once they become adults, they're going to be living in and in forms of employment. So mm -hmm. I, I think at the end of the day, we need to really just make sure the focus is on that diversity from a very early age, because hopefully that will lead to them being accepting and understanding of others for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Um, how has autism impacted your life? Um, and, and what made you want to share your journey with others when you were in your twenties? I think the biggest thing was I didn't really have a lot of peer mentors who had autism when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And I realized by me sharing my story and my personal struggles, but also my accomplishments, I could also be a mentor to others. I have a 501c3 nonprofit organization called KFM Making a Difference, where I provide mentoring services for those with special needs. Mm -hmm. And it was really because I really didn't have those mentoring opportunities. And I felt very isolated as a kid. And I know that's still a struggle that many are dealing with today. So once I started talking about autism, I realized by sharing my own personal story, along with helpful resources within the community, it would just add another element to this community by being able to help them understand a first person perspective of somebody who actually has autism today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanna hear more about your, your nonprofit. You guys also um, have scholarships? Yeah, so uh, we actually just announced our spring 2021 uh, scholarship recipients. So uh, over the past nine years, we've been able to give out 100 uh, partial scholarships for autistic students to go to college. And uh, it's been a passion uh, project, a labor of love for me, uh, simply because uh, when I was going to college for the first time, I received very minimal scholarship aid because I was terrible at standardized testing. And mm -hmm. most post-secondaries look at GPA and SATs as mm -hmm. well as two of the biggest metrics towards scholarship aid. So I realized that there was a big need for scholarships for this community because it was a common obstacle that many were facing. And uh, yeah, we started out with one scholarship. We just gave out 14 this spring. And uh, it's been one of our big initiatives. In addition to that, we do the self-advocate videos we were just talking about as part of the nonprofit, the mentoring as mm -hmm. well as a big part of that. And then uh, also sensory uh, friendly events. I uh, dress up as Santa Claus every year and I host a, a autism and sensory friendly Santa event 
for children with autism who might have challenges with loud noises, bright light, mm -hmm. and give them an opportunity to be in an inclusive setting to get some, for some of them getting the first opportunity to meet Santa Claus. Yeah, I read about that. So can you tell me more about that? What does that Santa like look like? Uh, it is very inclusive. It is, if a child is stimming or flapping and moving their hands around, uh, it's being close to them, but also realizing that they need, need their own personal space. Mm -hmm. It's also being sure to have elves who have personal experience as special education teachers and therapists who really understand the needs of these kids versus people who might not have that connection and might not understand when a kid is having a meltdown or having uh, some communication challenges as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it's also just about making sure that it's accommodating by making sure that there's less crowds, less bright lights, mm -hmm. uh, less external noise, and mm -hmm. really just trying to interact with the parents beforehand to make sure that we're being these kids where they are in their own development. Because uh, like autism and many disabilities, it is a spectrum. And some of the challenges can be very small and then some of them can be rather large. So just making sure we meet them at their at their levels. That's awesome. Is that in New Jersey, I assume? Yes. Uh, one of the fun things uh, that we were able to do last year though, was we did a virtual event uh, which we had families from across the globe uh, getting to have a Zoom with Santa. Uh, so uh, it, it was great to have the opportunity to connect with people across the globe uh, to give them a sensory friendly event to enjoy during the holiday season. And how did that go? I mean, did you think it was a success, something you want to do again if you, like, not, is that something you want to incorporate now every year? Or was it something that um, you much it, rather not do if you have the opportunity to be in person? It's definitely something I want to do because it, for, for one, one, one of the things that we advertised was individuals who had uh, immune challenges. Mm, yeah. To, um, who might not necessarily even be able to go out to a public area due yeah. to having those health concerns. So it's it's simply something that, that I've been talking to my team about in a little bit more detail. And it's something that we have on the table potentially for December of this year. Yeah, I think um, even after, you know, people aren't as scared about the pandemic, um, maybe some people are gonna continue having a heightened awareness and fear about going out with their kids, um, especially in our community. Well, yeah, and and, and I mean, we, it's, I, I feel like this has been a wake up call to the importance of really embracing technology as a whole. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because so many of our special need families have felt that isolation even before COVID-19 and not really being able to navigate the world. So mm -hmm. being able to provide not only sensory friendly inclusive events, but also providing events that can be virtually uh, really, really are beneficial. I know some of the kids who were on with us this year, for example, it's uh, some of them didn't have their cameras on and that was perfectly okay because some of them were intimidated by showing themselves to a Santa, a stranger that they've never met before. So mm -hmm. uh, having those opportunities was uh, really, really helpful to many of our families who we've connected with. What are some of your favorite, do you get to choose the topic when you're hired for speaking engagements? Um, or do they usually tell you what they want you to talk about? <laughs> uh, Honestly, 90, 95% of the time, it's it's always, they're looking for a certain niche, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, something autism related, whether it's uh, something for a business, which is innovation driven, how to uh, communicate internally within a company to expand your business. I mean, it really is just based, and, and we have a wide group of people we connect with. So it's really just based on the internal needs of each one of those organizations that we mm -hmm. go with. Well, I'm interested in um, bullying. 
which you are passionate about uh, speaking about. Can you share with me um, the messages that you like to convey when speaking about bullying? Absolutely. Uh, I used to be bullied as a kid and mm. it was one of the greatest struggles I dealt with growing up. Uh, after I started speaking, I, I started talking for the first time when I was about two and a half and then police sentences at seven. And then most of my challenges after that were sensory related and uh, bullying. So uh, today in our society, bullying impacts uh, one in five students today, and it's twice as more prevalent in the special needs community. And I say that to students be, and, and faculty because I feel like it's really important to celebrate differences within our community. Yeah. That you might see somebody who might look a little different, who might act a little different than you, but we are all human at the end of the day, and we should be celebrated for who we are as people. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely a universal message that I try to spread in all my bullying prevention related talks. October is National Bullying Prevention Month, which is usually our second busiest month where I'm speaking at uh, at least one school a day about wow. this topic and uh, share my own personal story, but then also making sure these kids realize celebrating differences is important. It's for faculty that it's, it's not kids will be kids. It's really impacting the community and words do have power. And mm -hmm. uh, we kind of have lived in this like mantra of sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me when it's actually quite the opposite with so many individuals who not only deal with disabilities, but also deal with anxiety and depression. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it's really important to have these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in a perfect world, how do you, how would you like to see schools uh, in particular um, preventing bullying and handling it when it does happen? Uh, one of the biggest things right away would be unified classrooms. I, I, I'm a, a huge advocate for inclusion and the importance of having the opportunity for kids with disabilities to interact with kids who don't have disabilities. Mm -hmm. I feel like across the board, that would be something I would be looking at. Uh, the second thing was I would make sure the curriculum is focused primarily on educating about those individuals with differences. Mm -hmm. uh, some states already have mandated that as part of K through 12 curriculum that you have to educate on disability. I, I know New Jersey, uh, Governor Murphy was one of the people who truly advocated for that. And I really, thought, yeah, I thought that was amazing. Uh, so I think as across the board, we, we need to have those conversations and get that education out there. Um, because, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I feel like a lot of the times school systems will say, well, it's the parents' responsibility. And some, some households are not necessarily the most equipped for these, these yeah. kids. And some of them go through very rigorous challenges at home. So being able to have a nurturing environment in the schools where th these opportunities are possible, I think is really important to end building. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, can't really say it's the parent's responsibility, at least in the public school system. I think they're supposed to you know, be able to feed everyone because some might say that's the parent's responsibility too, but doesn't right. happen. So the school takes over. Right. So I think that that would be wonderful to see. And that's that's great to hear that they're going to do that in New Jersey. It started already? Uh, yes. So I was on an advisory group ran by the Department of Education to actually oversee some of the related topics when, when it came to that. So uh, it's currently being put into place. It's amazing. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing hopefully this being implemented in all 50 states in the nearby future. Yeah, I agree. That's good. Um, what are some of your other most favorite messages to, to get out to the public? Well, I think, you know, there's a great advocate named Christopher Ulmer. He runs a Facebook page called Special Books by Special Kids. Hmm. 
And what I love that he said uh, as part of his video series is that he wants to normalize the human condition. Mm-hmm. And I really love that concept of just normalizing the, the world, which feels like it's more diverse every single day. <laughs> it's like we're, we're hearing about all these disabilities. And also in addition to that, they, there's so many disabilities that continue to be on the rise. Um, yeah. And a lot of the time it's because less kids are falling through the cracks and we're making sure to get these kids diagnosed so they can receive uh, services. So I think one of the other big messages I really try to get out there is the importance of understanding that this is a community that continues to be on the rise and we have to make sure that we are looking out for them. Uh, Those with disabilities make up the largest minority right now in the United States and often they're one of the most underserved due to the fact that some individuals with disabilities have very severe challenges and can't speak up for themselves, especially Mm -hmm. when it comes to grassroots change within their local communities. Mm -hmm. So as a society, we need to make sure that they are not falling through the cracks because too often uh, it is the case in most of our communities. Yeah, I had been thinking about, you know, the messages, some of these messages that you're talking about recently, because, you know, Recently, we've been kind of, there's been a lot of, I don't watch a lot of news. I try not to, but you know, there's been a lot of um, speaking (laughs) up for, (laughs) speaking up for, um, you know, celebrating each other's differences and how do people thinking about, you know, outside the box on how to include different people. Maybe it's um, sexuality or, or race um, and, and be mindful of how people maybe weren't being included and try and include them more now. And I would like to say the same for the, our, our community, because so often the people are just, you know, they might glaze, like look over someone like they're not even really there and not really acknowledge them as a human. Um, and I'd love to see some change there too. And all these things that you're talking about in schools and um, educating, those are great ideas. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I, I, I agree. That's uh, the, the other thing that I just absolutely love and I continue to try to share on my social media channels was when, when we were in, in the in the ferry lockdown stage of COVID-19, some good news by uh, John Krasinski that was out there really was just incredible because like you said, it's like you, you don't yeah. try to watch the news. Yeah. It's, every single time you turn on the news, it's like- It's, it's all talking. just what's negative. Yeah, exactly. It's talking about Moderna, it's talking about Pfizer, it's talking about like the incidents in Haiti that are currently going on. It's, it's just on and on and on. And it's And don't get me wrong, those stories are important, but what are we doing to get the stories out there about the individuals who are making a difference in their local communities? I feel like, for for example, I'm a big advocate. I I always am watching uh, NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. And one of the things that I love at the end of most of their telecasts is they have a segment called Inspiring America. Hmm. But why just have one segment, like one three to five minute segment? And don't get me wrong, I I, I was featured on the Today Show on NBC years ago, and I absolutely love the the work that they do on their network. Mm -hmm. It it feels like we don't hear enough about those stories. And I feel like if we've heard more about those stories, it it would definitely, because a lot of those stories are diverse in nature, it would educate the, the community so much more. Yeah. I know. Wouldn't it be nice to have some, a lot more, or 50% of the news or more be um, inspiring and empowering, lifting each other up, teaching you how to take care of yourself too, and others. Um, Yeah, well, I see, I see the work that you're doing and I appreciate it. Um, And, um, it's 
Wonderful. I think that's one of the beautiful things about social media is that's how I found you. Um, I want to know a little bit more to close out on your nonprofit. Um, so you've been doing all this for 10 years. Um, and then was that when you started your 501c3 as well? Did everything start at once or what was the timeline of your business? Sure. So, so I was an undergraduate in college, not knowing anything of what I was doing. And I filed the paperwork uh, in 2011. Oh. And I heard back rather quickly. I, I, I got the status in 2012. And then I was like lightning speed, like I need to start a scholarship program. I need to do this. I need to do that. And I, I'm a one man show. I mean, I I, I have this nonprofit as my side work that I do uh, with a full-time career in public speaking. It's something that I still have a passion for. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm a one man really? with a very small board ran organization who's just trying to make a difference in the lives of our community. That's why I called it KF and making a difference. And mm -hmm. we do the scholarship programs. We do the video series. We do the sensory friendly events. We do the educational events where we try to break down barriers. We try to host uh, free events when we can to educate our community on a wide range of diversity related issues as well, kind of as an information series, if you will. So we, we do a little bit of everything in, in our spare time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's a labor of love at the end of the day. Um. Where did you, so after you got approved for the 501c3, then what did you, how do you primarily do your fundraising? Uh, most of it is uh, online fundraising. I mean, our website, kfmmakingadifference.org uh, is where we receive a wide range of donations, but we've also been very lucky to have a lot of people who've wanted to support us on social media. Uh, in this digital age of Facebook fundraisers, uh, mm -hmm. we have raised almost $40,000 simply from Facebook fundraisers and uh, Facebook donations over time. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's just been a great platform as well. We, we also have uh, an annual event uh, in New Jersey where we often bring scholarship winners from previous years to share their stories okay. in a fundraising gala that we do at, as well. So those are some of the biggest ways. And then also just offline donations and uh, corporate sponsors uh, every now and then. Tell me more about your gala. Sure. So we have a very small uh, gala every year uh, at a uh, restaurant called the uh, Brightside Tavern, which is actually in Jersey City. Uh, and uh, we, we, we love the opportunity. Just uh, typically it's just local NJ politicians, family and friends who come out and uh, just celebrate the accomplishments of people within our very uh, special community. And uh, it's it's just an amazing opportunity to, we, we also highlight some of the self-advocates uh, who we do videos. We post their videos uh, during the presentations on a big board so everybody could see a little bit more of the work that we're uh, currently doing. Mm. And what, going back to you and your you know, upbringing in your journey, you said that you were speaking full sentences at seven and primarily after that, it, you, your biggest issues that you were struggling with were bullying and, and the other one, it was bullying and sensory stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. But after, so what kind of treatments or therapies or what did you do to support or what did your parents um, support you in? So uh, I, I started receiving, when I was diagnosed with autism at four, I started receiving speech, occupational and physical therapy, mm -hmm. uh, which was tremendous. Uh, typically those are the mo three most common therapies you'll hear in the autism community. And then uh, later on, because the sensory challenges were so strenuous, uh, I, I was telling people when I was a kid, I wanted to be the sixth member of the Backstreet Boys uh, <laughs> because I, I, I fell in love with music, even though there's something with loud noises, there was always something soothing about music. Yeah. 
So got involved with music therapy, theater therapy uh, along the way as well to build on this, the sensory challenges, but then also the theater aspect of building on communication and social skills. Uh, and uh, th that was kind of what led me to where I am today. So tell me more about that. Was it actually music? Was it called music therapy or was it just, you know, yeah, enjoying and creating music? I was music therapy. I would go to special uh, camps where oh, okay. they focus specifically on that. But it, it was also just very a uh, therapeutic activity yeah. especially when I was dealing with uh, sensory challenges. That's awesome. And so did you continue theater and, and music throughout? Do you still do it? Or I, did you end? <laughs> yeah, I'm obsessed with theater. Uh, I can't sing for the life of me. So my musical talents never came to fruition. <laughs> <laughs> Mine but, neither. But yeah, um, I, so I fell in love with the idea of combining my love of theater and my love of disability advocacy to do consulting work. So uh, I've had the opportunity to continue theater today in a consulting role. Uh, I am, I have my own IMDB page and I've been, uh, had the opportunity to be the autism entertainment consultant on uh, three projects, uh, Joyful Noise with Queen Latifah and Dolly Parton in 2011. Uh, Jane Wants a Boyfriend in 2013, and HBO's Mrs. Fletcher in 2019, uh, all with an autistic character in those projects uh, with the idea of reviewing each script and making sure that the character was as realistic as humanly possible mm -hmm. to our autism community. Mm -hmm. So I've uh, kept a very uh, close uh, tie in the Warner Brothers world and the the, the other entertainment uh, worlds as, as well and in, in trying to make sure that there is authentic representation uh, right. of the disability community on on the screen. Yeah, so I was, I was kind of I'm curious about that. Um, do are, are you cool with it when they just try and create or act like they are disabled? Or, you know, because I, I recently, and this might be a touchy subject, but I was kind of curious, like I said, with certain things happening right now and, and certain news, I wonder, I relate it back to what we're doing. And I was curious about, I know that some people, there's been some backlash about, um, you know, even in Disney movies or something, or if someone is voicing, let's say um, another race, and the person who's voicing it isn't actually of that ethnicity. So does it, you know, in your mind, is it the same thing for the disabled community? You know what's interesting? That has come up a lot recently. One of my favorite shows growing up as a kid, for example, was The Simpsons. It's like, I could tell you. <laughs> I actually watched I could, a lot of that too. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I, I, I could legitimately like, tell you like the entire like episodes for 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 certain uh episodes in the simpsons uh because it's it i because also at the same time i, I loved doing theater but i also loved watching theater and watching different projects and entertainment projects as well uh so i've noticed a lot of that recently um and why i mentioned in the simpsons is because uh there's a great actor uh hank Osaria, and uh He's been in a lot of roles, but he also do does a lot of uh, does a lot of um, the Simpson characters. And he said he wasn't going to do um, there. It's a character named Apu anymore because he's a white male and Apu is of Indian descent. Uh, and I found that just so interesting. Uh, so I started reading up a lot a lot about the subject mm -hmm. and. Uh, in our community, also, th there has been a lot of backlash about uh, non-disabled actors playing disabled characters. Right. Uh, so I, I think at the end of the day, it's important that if you are having non-disabled actors, that you need to have some kind of consultant behind yeah. the scenes at the bare minimum. Right. Um, 
I think there have been a lot of disabled actors who I know over the years have not received roles simply because they haven't even gotten the opportunity to audition for those roles. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I always say, some of the best ways of getting authentic representation are to talk to the people who've actually had those first person experiences. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important um, to, to really authentically get those portrayals uh, on, on camera and to give our disability community the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But um, so do you, you do some consulting for theater? Yeah, a lot I, of that? I do, I have uh, two NDAs I've signed for projects I'm currently uh, in the process of working on as well. Uh, so there will be a lot more stuff coming up in the uh, next few years, but I absolutely love what I do. And uh, it, it was a labor I loved when I was a kid uh, being uh, on stage and now getting the opportunity to still uh, be able to do this in a behind the scene role is kind of a dream come true. Yeah, I can imagine. It's like it all came back around. Yeah, full circle. Yeah. Carrie, is there anything else that um, you would like to share with the Brain Possible community today to be complete? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think one of the biggest things is that I never expected this to be my life. I was told by so many naysayers that I, I would be lucky to graduate from high school and going to college was kind of like a pipe dream when I was going through severe challenges on the autism spectrum. And, um, you know, I, I would definitely like to tell the, the your community it's that, you know, take take every day, day by day, realize that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon uh, in our community and to celebrate uh, small milestones as they come and try to make sure that regardless if you have a child who has a disability or not, that you are just trying to make sure that they try to live the best quality of life possible based where they are on their development. I honestly wish that every single person can you know, have a doctorate, be able to have a full-time career in public speaking. But I, again, I know that the community is a very wide spectrum. So let's just make sure that these individuals are living and having a happy and meaningful life based on what their passions and, and loves are. Yeah, and where they are right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, where can our listeners find out more about you and or uh, contact you about speaking engagements? Even actually, I'm curious when the last one is um, about applying for a scholarship. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, Individuals uh, who are watching this or listening to this can uh, check me out on my website, carriemagro.com. Uh, on my website, <clears throat> I also have a contact form if you would like to hire me to speak with your business, speak at your school, speak as part of a professional development for your educators. Definitely let me know. My email is carriemagro at gmail.com. You could also find me on Facebook at Carrie's Autism Journey, uh, Twitter and Instagram at Carrie Magro, uh, TikTok and YouTube also at Carrie <laughs> Magro. Again, all social media channels. And then for my scholarship, uh, you can learn more about our application at KFM making a difference.org where we actually just posted our uh, spring 2022 uh, scholarship application is now open for our community to uh, enjoy. You do bi biannual scholarships? Uh, every year. So oh, our, annually. Yeah. So our uh, 2021 uh, scholarship was uh, winners, recipients were just announced and now we're uh, right going back to uh, spring 2022. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. You are all over the place doing a lot of things. And um, I want to thank you for um, who you are in this world um, and who you, you know, what you're, what you're doing here for the greater good. 
Well, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to also just get the word out. And it's it, it's people like yourself and with these podcasts that really just provide an educational opportunity for our community to enjoy and get to know a little bit more about the community around us. So I applaud you guys for what you're doing too. Thank you. I hope that you enjoyed our conversation today and that you learned something new. Do you have a question for Carrie? Do you have your own story that you would like to share with us? We would love to hear from you. Let us know how we can be useful in your journey. Email us at info at thebrainpossible.com. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and share our podcast if that feels true for you. You may also consider visiting our website, thebrainpossible.com, for more information on stories, therapies, and products that we think that you will love and may support you on your healing journey. As always, thank you for spending your precious time with us at The Brain Possible. See you next week and be well.